thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be there, unfortunately, uh, only virtually. I prepared a short presentation, so I really prepared a very um, short point, and the title of my presentation is rather long. Um, I would like um, to divide my presentation like in three um, parts. Um, the first part is to give you an overview um, about um, a very short, quick overview. Um, about the notion um, of law in ancient uh, Roman law, to bring you some uh, quotations. Um, the second part is um, also a very quick um, overview about some aspects um, of uh, slavery in ancient Roman law, um, and then uh, go further to a case, um, to a specific case um, we, ha we have in the digest, and to try a reading um, of this case in the perspective of phenomenological um, approach. So it might be a huge one, and uh, I tried to make it uh, rather short, um, and I'm also looking forward um, to discussion which might come out uh, from uh, my presentation. So um, the first point um, is um, that um, Roman jurists um, um, on law and justice. Um, the Digest, um, which is the compilation of Roman case law issued in the 6th century by the Byzantine uh, Emperor Justinian, um, contains one single definition um, of law. Um, in the very, very beginning of um, this compilation of this code, we can say, um, they use a definition which was originally made by um, a lawyer who lived in the 2nd century ED, um, which was um, used also by a lawyer which lived some 50, 100 years later. So we have um, Celsus and we have Ulpian. Um, his definition is Iosus ars boni et equi in Latin, or if we translate it into English, we have law as the art of what is good and just. I put also the Latin um, terms and because um, the definition is extremely hard and difficult uh, to translate into modern languages. I uh, chose a translation um, which, my, which I consider to be a, a good one. And um, one difficult part of the translation is already the, the, the concept of ars art. In my reading, the concept of ars means um, the technical, dogmatical aspects of law. So um, uh, I take occasion that I uh, say that uh, I enjoyed very much the presentation before. And, and here we have also in, in Roman uh, law, we have the technical and um, dogmatical approach um, which comes within the concept um, of art. And then we have also the term of equitas. And some scholars say, say that it might be something related to the Aristotelian uh, epikeia. And I have much more the impression that is um, justice um, in the sense as uh, our Jewish Ulpian um, also use it later, um, saying to give um, everyone his due, um, this might be uh, justice. And so uh, we have here the translation of equitas um, also um, with justice. Um, the next point um, we have here is um, the um, definition given by Ulpian about law, which is um, rather a division of law, which is a, a partitio of law. And we say that private law is divided in natural law. Here we have natural law. And the law of nations, which is the use against you, and the civil law. Civil law in this context means uh, the law of the Roman uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. So we have like uh, three parts uh, in the law, in the natural law, in the very first point, um, Ulpia mentions this, and um, then the second one, the law of nations, um, which means all nations, and uh, we read it in another part, uh, which are governed by law. And the second time uh, they mention is governed by law and customs. Mm -hmm. These are uh, the law of um, nations. And the third one is the specific, very specific uh, Roman law, uh, a law which is um, only used um, by Roman uh, citizens. 
And um, when we have this item um, of um, natural law, and we think um, to combine it all, uh, with um, the uh, fact that Roman in Roman society, as in all ancient societies, slavery um, was uh, present. Um, so um, we can also see here, mm -mm, and, and, and second point, just put the typical one, the second point um, that um, um, Ulpian in the same one in these institutiones, which was um, supposed to be a kind of um, textbook, um, here um, give us and he gives us the idea that under natural law, um, all uh, men were born free. And hmm? um, Ulpian is a, a scholar, a British uh, scholar, Tony Honoré, um, who wrote the uh, book about um, Ulpian, and he gave uh, the book, he gave the book the title pioneer of human rights. And, and here we have like uh, some quotations um, which make it um, really um, understandable why he used this point. So uh, for under natural law, all men were born free. And then he uh, put um, the idea of manumission, which is the possibility to free slaves. And so he say, um, and manumission was not known as slavery itself was not recognized. But after Jus Gentium introduced slavery, the benefit of manumission also came in. So the idea that, that Ulpian uses here is um, that slavery um, was introduced by um, Jus Gentium, by the law of nations. And when the law of nations introduced um, uh, slavery, um, so um, um, Romans created like the idea of manumission, the possibility and the free slaves. Then we have a, a further quotation on slavery. As far as the use civile is concerned, slaves are not regarded as persons. Now we have like the, the third and um, second term which enters here. We say the use um, civile, which is the law of the Roman citizens. And then they say that slaves are not regarded as persons. This is, however, not true under natural law. Because so far as natural law is concerned, all men are equal. Hmm? And omnes eh, homines equalis sunt. Hmm? It sounds like a modern declaration of human rights. Hmm? And omnes homines eh, equalis sunt. And we have um, a further quotation from another uh, jurist who was um, more or less um, contemporary um, uh, of um, Ulpian. And he says, um, freedom is a man's natural capacity of doing what he pleases unless he is prevented by force or law. Slavery is an institution of use gentium by which one man is made the property of another one. And here the, the point, contrary um, to nature, hmm? contrary to nature. And um, so um, we might um, perhaps expect um, that um, with all those quotations, that uh, Romans um, should have abolished slavery. Mm, um, we know uh, that they didn't do it, um, but they had an interesting um, aspect um, of um, slavery. Mm. Um, and on one point, um, we must mention an important um, difference um, between ancient slavery and the so-called uh, modern slavery. One important um, difference is um, that Roman slavery ne never was based on race. Mm. And slaves did not form a uniform um, social groups. In, in many cases, it was not um, possible to distinguish whether someone uh, was a slave or free citizens um, on the basis of his outward um, appearance as clothing, uh, profession, and behavior. Um, another important issue was the one of manumission, we already mentioned. And uh, then um, we can um, also see that there was a huge mobility uh, between uh, free men and slavery. The uh, Roman society was um, characterized by the item. Um, a German um, scholar, Elisabeth Hermann Otto, who has been um, during 30 years a coordinator of a project on ancient slavery, highlighted that Rome has never been a slave owning society as it might uh, be used in the sense of Karl Marx, for instance, um, but um, that Rome has been a, a society where uh, there lived uh, free people and uh, free men and uh, slaves. And 
every uh, free man could potentially become a slave and um, any slave could potentially uh, become a free man. Um, after this, um, we might um, also say that uh, Romans had a very, very uh, pragmatic approach um, towards slavery. So of course, they never um, questioned um, the fact to abolish slavery um, or to don't use it. On the contrary, um, they made a huge use of slavery, um, as um, we know. Um, but this um, um, pragmatic approach led them uh, to use slaves also as active participants in um, economic uh, life. Um, slaves were uh, employed um, to foster economic uh, success and development. Um, in numerous uh, cases, slaves acted as a manager of small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, the Italian um, scholar Andrea Di Porto coined uh, for this structure uh, the term lo schiavo manager, the slave um, manager. Um, a Hungarian author wrote a book in, in which he derives numerous institutions of modern uh, commercial law from this very uh, area of slave commitment. Mm. This schiavo manager, this slave manager, meant that the owner of the slave separated a part of his capital and assigned it to a slave. The, this amount of money was called a uh, peculio. And within a radius of action in defined by the master mm, through a prepositio, um, the slave could develop business activity um, of any kind. Mm. Uh, Romans held that the legal tie could only come into existence between the contracted parties, which in this case might be the slave and um, the, mm, his the party with whom he makes um, the contract. And so in order to um, achieve the aim that um, also, if it was the case, um, the contract party of the slave could sue somebody, the slave, it was not possible to sue the slave, they introduced remedies uh, which made it possible to sue the owner of the slave. So um, in practical business life, um, this system of peculium, of money, capital, which was um, dedicated to a slave, led to a limited liability in, in business activity. Because um, in, within this business activity, um, the amount was fixed um, for uh, liability. So the master was uh, only liable um, for this amount he dedicated um, for the slave. And um, perhaps it's uh, interesting to mention um, that um, if um, business activity was carried out within family enterprises, which was the uh, other possibility, um, liability was an unlimited liability of all um, family members. So um, the slave was an important part of economic life. And if you look a little bit further, we have a case. So we arrive to the case which might be somehow in the center of our considerations now. And the case was a typical one, we can say, where a slave, he was directed under a bill to pay the hair, then away and become free. Received his freedom absolutely under codicil. But being ignorant of the fact, paid, paid 10 aurei to the hair. And can he bring in an action for recovery um, of the money? And um, many times hmm, the uh, master, the owner um, of a slave, um, freed the slave in the last will. That was a rather common thing in Rome. And um, we can imagine here um, that this slave has a peculium. So he was working in an enterprise. And so the idea which might be behind the um, dish of the master um, should be that the slave become free. And now uh, he may, might run his enterprise um, as a free uh, man. Um, but out of the enterprise, um, he should pay um, like uh, some money to the heir hmm, who lost, of course, uh, the enterprise, uh, which was a uh, property um, of um, the testator. Um, we have here two last uh, wills, the one which was a formal one, 
and, and the second one, uh, which was an informal one. In the formal last will, um, our um, intestator said that he should be free with um, and under condition to pay 10. In the second one, um, he said he might be free without any condition. Hmm? And here we have the very um, interesting um, part um, that um, two jurists formed an opinion, the elder Celsus hmm, and the younger one, um, Celsus, who was the same jurist we mentioned in the beginning, um, who coined this word uses as boniet equi, so law is what is good and just. And his father was an elder jurist, and he said that he, the slave, should not be able to recover um, what he has uh, paid to the heir. Um, the younger one um, said he should be able um, to recover um, what he has um, paid. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because um, Roman jurists had a very um, traditional approach to law. So for them, uh, the opinions of their uh, predecessors were important opinions. And therefore, we have here also the point that the younger one. Um, Yeah, that the younger one um, contradicts the elder one. Um, so it, it's a, a point which not often happened um, in, in, yeah, in ancient um, jurisprudence, hmm, that the younger one contradicts to his father. Hmm? And the reason he gives, neither of the two jurists uh, actually gives us a reason, but the reason given by the younger census is um, natural equitas, hmm? equitas uh, naturalis. Excuse me, now I have a... Influenced uh, by natural uh, justice hmm? is the reason which was uh, given uh, by um, the younger one. Now, um, very quickly was the point, my idea uh, was um, to put, um, to read the text uh, through um, a phenomenological approach. Adolf Reiner, one of the most outstanding um, members of the phenomenological, realistic phenomenological school, um, who spoke about uh, social acts. Hmm? He approached the whole topic uh, with social acts. Hmm? He understood communication through external signs that creates rights and duties. And then he put these four characteristic intentionality, which was one of the key items um, of, um, of a moralistic approach, spontaneity, other directnesses, and need of being heard. So we have here in the end, like some social acts to inform, command, request, question, yield, submit, enact, create. So we have here some examples to give for social acts. And my idea might be to read the whole case um, in um, the perspective of these social acts, in the perspective of a personal relationship. And here we might hear the difference between and rather abstract natural law we read before, which at the end didn't lead really to consequences, to practical or not always led to consequences. And here we have the other point, um, which is the idea of social acts. Um, very uh, quickly, Adolf Reiner himself, of course, was aware of the problem of slavery in ancient Rome. And he said um, that um, it is not because the slaves were human beings just as much as free men, but it was because that they were able mm, to promise and to be promised to. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the key issues of social acts that, that they were able to promise and they were able to receive um, um, considerations and um, they were able to be uh, promised. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, the last point where we can imagine somehow how it might have worked. Um, so we can have here two relationships, the one of the testator um, in direction to the hair. Um, and then we have here two social acts, the command and the request. And then we have a second um, relationship between uh, the freed slave and the hair. And the freed slave fulfilled the command without knowing that there was a request. 
the command is like much stronger, the request is not so strong. And so um, we have here a uh, natural justice, um, which might come into the discussion in the relationship between uh, the, the, state of the state and the hair mm, um, to enforce the request, which was not a command, which was not a formal command. And in the other point, um, we have um, also uh, the need, uh, let's say, um, of um, reference to natural justice um, in order to overcome, overcome this point from the part of the slave, um, that when he effected the payment, he was still a, a slave from a formal point of view, and he wanted to bring in the suit for recovery, and he was already a freedman. Hmm? So it, there was a personal a change of a personal status, which had to be um, overcome. And in both cases, we can imagine um, that um, this um, equitas naturalis was used uh, my impression is, after reading um, many of these cases, um, so Roman intuition, Roman uh, spontaneous um, results, um, spontaneous opinions of the Jewish, uh, many times had a very deep um, foundation in a um, personal and uh, personalistic approach, um, which afterwards, for instance, phenomenological school elaborated with a lot of effort. And at the same time, uh, we see the Roman jurists did it in an intuitive and spontaneous uh, way. So um, this was the point I might, um, I wanted to present. And also um, an, an idea, this uh, personalistic approach um, we find might come somehow uh, close to the um, idea of, of Ubuntu as I understood it no? during some of the uh, presentations I had uh, heard the last two days. So thank you very much um, for your attention and I'm looking forward to questions. <laughs>